Hey, Kate, can you try speaking? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you guys. It's a, like a, a little bit breaking up when you use the microphone, but I can hear you. Justin, you use some crystal clear. Yep. Good. Everybody's good online. Yeah. All right. I don't think I don't know if the online folks can. Oh well, yeah, I'm sure you can see us. Oh wait, no, we, we need to share our screen. Beautiful. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get rolling. Welcome to the the lunch and learn today. We've got a, a nice lineup, and and I don't want to spend too much time, um, but we did want to do some blocking and tackling uh, first before we get rolling. Blocking and tackling. Yeah, blocking and tackling. That's all. Okay. So this is just a, a reminder. So welcome, everybody. Um, this is just a reminder. So. For this Department of Medicine program, we have a certificate in translation, clinical and translational research. Um, and we had, ah, there's, come on down, Dave. Um, so I know, so we have, there's about 178 students who have been interested, expressed interest in actually doing a research project. A small fraction of them have actually started. Uh, the we, we sort of knew this going in. There's obviously more students than there are faculty, and it just takes a while to get your legs underneath you and get going into a research project, which is why we developed this clinical and translational uh, research uh, certificate. Um, and so that you could actually have something tangible um, within a short period of time as you're, as you're progressing through research. So uh, obviously the, one of the, the uh, you know, requirements for this is actively participating. Um, in the program with a faculty mentor and completing the evaluations forms, completing the city modules. Almost all of you should have had those done already because we've already baked those into the, uh, to the research curriculum. Um, participating in at least eight of these lunch and learn workshops. So I know there's a lot of repeat Dr. customers. Dr. this caps as your first Yeah, one. this is Dr. Meek's first one. So. Um, uh, and um, then authoring or co-authoring an abstract at our annual uh, research symposium or uh, attending at least six of the divisional activities in the Department of Medicine. So those would be seminars, journal clubs, case reviews, path you know, reviews, et cetera, um, and then submitting a research report on one of those experiences. Um, so speaking of which, so we want to make this easy for you, right? So how do I know what's going on in the, in the division? Share for the WebEx people. I may have to share the screen. Anyhow, um, so if you go to, if you're online, if you go to the, the website there or just type in, um, so the online folks can see the screen. Um, but we have our website all set up, and on that website, they can, they can see it. I just Yeah, go stop sharing. Cool. Everybody see that online? Awesome. Cool. So if you go to the calendar, this handy dandy calendar, this is uh, your one stop shop for seeing what's going on in uh, in medicine, all the all the divisional activities. Um, and so you can click on those, you can see how to attend, etc. Um, this is, it's not a final uh, product. There's some things right now, like, uh, for instance, there's some journal clubs that used to be held at like off campus, like a fancy restaurant. Um, and so we're, we're trying to work with people and come up with a way that, you know, obviously they can't have a hundred students show up to a journal club at Nancy Steakhouse. So, um, we're That's trying like to, I to yeah. <laughs> besides we already, we already RSVP for all of them. So. Um, anyhow, so we're trying to come up with ways that 
they may be able to include more students, or maybe we have like an RSVP for like the uh, say, for instance, if you're interested in dermatology, um, that we just rotate through some students who are interested. So um, anyhow, but that's going on. So you can go there and 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 see that again. It's your one-stop shop. So if you go to the Department of Medicine's website. Um, and then this is the calendar. It's linked on our main page of the medicine website, and it's also linked under the Mentor uh, Student Research Program. So again, you can click on those. You can see what's going on. You can see what days are, and if they're of uh, interest to you at all. So that is that. Stop sharing that now. Um, um, and then. Office hours. So this was this was stolen from Duncan. Um, so again, it, it, tons of students interested in doing research, um, and but you know trying to get okay finding a mentor and, and whatever going through that process. And uh, most of you probably have submitted something and said, "Hey, I'm interested in rheumatology." Um, so what we want to do. So the Biomedical Research Society and Justin's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, has options to get you involved and, and kind of self-starting. Um, and Steve and I will have office hours, and, and Justin has, uh, has graciously offered through Biomedical Research Society to have um, some office hours to kind of help do some peer-to-peer -peer mentoring on uh, kickstarting research, uh, even if somebody hasn't responded yet to your, your request to do a project. Um, Steve and I are also going to offer office hours in a, in a similar fashion, we'll try to be strategic so that we're not doing it at the same time that the Biomedical Research Society is. Um, and we'll have those likely on Fridays. We'll put them on the calendar so that you can see. This is a place so you can go in. We'll do it hybrid, you know, so you can uh, you know come to the lab or you can go in over WebEx. And you can just uh, talk about, okay, I'm having an issue with this. I'm having a problem with this. This is an opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one you know, time with us and uh, get advice, et cetera. And then also, you know, just, you know, you may not have a question or know the question you have, uh, but, you know, Jonathan Hunyadi has a question and he's talking and whatever and you're learning uh, from that. So um, we'll be offering those probably like twice a, twice a month or so and, and making that so, no, so while we're on Fridays at like 4 p.m., just like that. Fridays at four, you're probably not going to have too many classes at that time. And then Dr. Buchan, you and I normally meet around 5, 5.30. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll post it for that. Awesome. So again, look for the look on the calendar for that, uh, those informations, and we'll post those. And frankly, Justin, if you want to post your office hour on, on there, that's fine. Um, do we have Ben? So uh, the Translational Medicine Journal Club will be starting as well. Um, this, I think, is going to be on first Fridays uh, around noon, and so um, we'll we'll set out. In addition to putting it on the calendar, and we'll also announce things through through uh, Amy Phillips and Don Jagzinski emails, etc. Um, so you can you can look for those. But um, this translational medicine journal club will be starting, and again, the focus of this is not like to have like another journal club, but it's to help you to start to think about peer reviewing. Um, and how you would peer review a paper that dovetails perfectly with what's going on with the, the journal translation. Um, so we'll work through those. And I think the first one's going to be like this, some one of the first Fridays in December. That'll there will be an announcement that goes on about that. And then there will, that'll be on the, on the WebEx uh, or uh, on, on the calendar. All right. Without further ado, we will start online. We will rotate. Maybe we'll rotate. We'll start, we'll start. So we have five uh, medical students uh, here today. I think probably most of you know them. Um, Catherine Becker is online. Um, and Alex Cartel is, is also online and hybrid. Uh, Dana Craig is here. And then it is, it is uh, PhD as well. Justin Creed, you know, it is PhD is doing Justin Creed. And we've got Frank, who is M4. Rebecca did some head done some research with us. So I think um, maybe what we'll do is bounce back and forth in person, online, in person, online. So I want to start with Rebecca, if you don't mind. And so. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. Um, 
and for right now, just a little bit about me. Um, according to UAE, I've been in China for a while. When I was in Asia, everybody used to my family moved to Cleveland. Um, and then from there, I did, you know, middle school, high school. Went to University of Chicago for undergrad. Uh, then I actually went back to China for a year to do a speech there. And then I started medical school at Toledo. Uh, and I'm right now applying to internal medicine. Um, and hopefully, ultimately, pursuing gastroenterology. Um, but in terms of the research I would like to do in medical school, I've been done um, some kind of basic sciences research. Um, but coming into med school, I really didn't have like, you know, an area that I was super interested in or knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, something that kind of influenced what I also like when I ultimately moved to China and kind of all of that uh, project here was that uh, the year that I spent living in China, there was a lot of problems with kind of like environmental contamination with food and water, um, specifically people worried about like heavy metal in the water, arsenic in the rice, or the source of you know poisoning from these things. But I spent the year there kind of uh, figuring out how to source like safe food and water, which is something I really never had to think about before. Um, and then when I started school here, I found out that you know it's crazy to go next to like here, but you come to Alba Boom are a huge problem here. So we got the big water advisory in 2014 because of the um, harmful pollutants, uh, mostly due to my persistent toxin that was getting into the water supply. Um, and then other smaller and entities obviously um, do a lot of research with their persistent toxin. Uh, well, that really was interesting to me, but I reached out to them to see if I could maybe project. Um, and specifically for after the summer after I one year, there's a lot of medical student research in London. So I kind of applied to work um, on that with them. And we kind of made this, you know, plan to run a like mentor kind of experiment, but then COVID hit that year. So everything plan kind of got scrambled um, and we ended up, you know, having to really just do everything kind of virtually on online. So it definitely has made a difference with how I move forward with those projects. Um, but ultimately, uh, I was able to, you know, do the summer project, the Castle Social Presentation. Um, eventually, we used some of that work to also do an infographic uh, and for policy makers of that kind of health effects um, of my persistent exposure. And then I've also also been to include on the review paper that um, was the lab. So that was kind of one around two years. Then starting at the end of three, after I did some of my clinical rotations, I kind of narrowed down on internal medicine and um, gastroenterology as a specialty. Uh, so I started looking for more research opportunities kind of in that arena. Um, and I, I found that I've always you know, loved food, nutrition, and um, cooking. That was a big hobby of mine. Um, so I started seeing if I could kind of get involved in research about diet and disease. Um, and the genetic department here is really great, but they focus much more on kind of like endoscopy. Um, type of research, so they're looking too much on kind of nutrition and diet and disease. Um, so I went outside of Toledo, I started working with uh, a PI at the University of Pittsburgh um, to kind of focus on this area uh, and was able to then do some uh, review kind of projects with uh, PI. Uh, and this was actually really good because um, one of the things that I was particularly interested in is during that year I spent in China, I noticed that. Uh, all the food there was like super, super salty. So I had been talking to my PI about, you know, what do you think of super high salt diet, which is just not. And there's a lot of work kind of about how it impacts like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, but he was an IDD researcher and kind of brought up, you know, that's not really something we've ever looked at it as people for. So then kind of gave me this research question that I went to the literature and just kind of phrased together a lot of areas of disparate research um, and put together. And then to review looking at this topic. And then from that point on, you know, I was also uh, accomplishing these in like a book chapter, and there was like a couple more papers coming uh, um, And then uh, the little picture is just a little graphic. I made a little paper on biobenders, which is actually very interesting to me too. So I would recommend if you ever need to make a figure for anything. Um, and then I'll see. Yeah, so kind of from my experiences doing research as a grad student. Um, some particular takeaways for you guys. I think, first of all, uh, I, I really actually have been super like, nice and helpful. I think if you're interested in research at all, just reach out to faculty. Um, and it, it looks like there's some new kind of progress and mentoring things starting here. That wasn't the case when I was starting. So I think that will help probably even more. Um, 
I would say that if you can, I know you're interested in research. I'll try to make sorry about the first or second year just because you'll have much more time um, kind of outside of the clinical setting. But I would say that it's also definitely not too late, you know, even if you're starting projects as a third year, um, the bulk of the kind of diaries and things that I started as a third year and we still had enough time to be quite productive. Um, so don't be afraid if you feel like you know, you're starting a little bit later. Uh, and then when you do get a project that you work on, kind of be proactive about pursuing it, um, checking in with your mentor, because if you do a project where everyone gets started at it more than you do. Um, and then I would also say don't be afraid to kind of try out different types of research. Um, as a med student, it's going to be really hard to do a lot of basic science or branch work research just because you know, you're studying your clinical responsibilities. Um, so, you know, things like review papers, case reports, like all the improvement projects, clinical trials, I think those are all fair game. Uh, and yeah. So. Thank you. And that's actually the next one. I don't know what we're doing with Q and I love that you talk about like going outside and empty and getting that experience because you know the, the instead of just languishing and waiting for something to go off to be good, you know, be proactive. Um we're gonna turn it over. If Kate, if you are good, I'm gonna try to share the screen. Can you hear me? We yes, we can hear you, and I, I just want to make it so that folks can see you too here in the room. All right, big. All right. So the this the screen is here, and we can hear you. We can hear you. So yeah. awesome. So I don't have any specific slides uh, prepared. I'm just gonna gonna talk to you guys a little bit about what my best advice for you to get involved in uh, research projects as medical students would be. Um, I guess if I, I tell you a little bit about myself to start as well, um, I did my undergrad at the University of Michigan. Uh, I came here to the University of Toledo in 2016. I am a seventh year in the MD PhD program here. I finished my PhD just this past year. Um, and I have been involved in clinical and basic science research uh, here during my time. So I think um, it's probably most valuable for you all to talk about more of the clinical research I've been in because I've worked with a lot more um, straight MD students in that. And sometimes I think that the PhD work can at times feel inaccessible to uh, people who are in the MD program, which is understandable. Um, so I guess, um, oh, I'm, I'm interested in neurosurgery. Most of the research that I've done is related to neurosurgery or um, cancer biology. I, um, my number one piece of advice is M1s and M2s is if you have an interest in a particular specialty, um, reach out to the other people who are interested in that specialty and the faculty who are at our school in that specialty. Um, it's, you know, you're, I think that a lot of people, especially when they start medical school, are really uh, timid to make those connections and feel like they, you know, they don't have kind of the basic um, physiology understanding to you know, kind of hang with research projects or engage with the literature, but you kind of just have to start somewhere. So whatever exposure you can get, um, try and shadow those clinicians in clinic if you can, even if it's, you know, every once in a while, try and see if there is a residency program at our school. Is there a journal club that that residency program has that is looking at, you know, what's going on in the literature of that field? Just, just any exposure that you can get to try and familiarize yourself with what the questions are that are important in that field. What is some, what is important to that practice and what do you notice is a gap in the knowledge that exists? And the only way that you're really going to start to notice those things is if you engage in, in what's going on in that field. Um, and really it, it requires a good amount of initiative, I think, on your part, you know, I think hopefully everybody understands that, you know, nobody's going to kind of walk up to you in the hallway and say, hey, do you want to be on my research project? You you definitely have to go out of your way to um, get involved in those things. But I think that by making those connections or going to clinic or meeting with the residents or faculty and interacting with them, one, you're going to just be around them more. So if case reports come up, if things like that come up, 
you're going to be the person that they know wants to work on research in this. So they're going to give you a call before they're going to call anybody else because they know, hey, you've been hanging around. You want to do this. You're interested in this. I'm, I'm sure you would work on it. And also, it just gives you an understanding of maybe what their schedule is like. What's the best way to get things done with this particular faculty member? Do you need to, um, you know, make friends with their assistant? Do you need to schedule meetings so that they're working meetings? You know, if, hey, we need to get this done, let's schedule a meeting so that we can do it and get it on the calendar instead of waiting for things to get back to you. So I definitely think don't be afraid to reach out to, you know, make those connections and, and be your own advocate for being involved. I think if you don't hear back, it's, a, it's not bothersome to send somebody another email, you know, a week later or just send it to the top of their email pile. The number of emails people get is truly, truly alarming. Um, yeah, and w when you meet with that faculty member or whoever, whatever the field is that you're interested in, try and get an understanding of one, what, do they have any functioning research projects right now? What are they looking for from you? How can you help facilitate things and help facilitate productivity? And what kind of resources are available to you to get research done? Is it only you? Are you the, are you the only one who's going to kind of be making things happen? Do you need to go learn about a specific, you know, statistical method to get numbers crunched? Do you have access to a database of solutions? here at UT? Do you have access to a national database? What kind of questions can you ask with the resources that are available? And I think it's it's helpful and important to to get an understanding of kind of just what are your options and then kind of move forward from there with guidance from that faculty member. Um, is there Are there questions? I also noticed that Margaret is here. I'm super excited that Margaret is here. Margaret Hoogland is our librarian over at in Malford. She's a huge help. If you, you know, a, a great place to start if you're wanting to get involved in something and you're interested in the field, especially as an M1 or M2, is do a literature review. Margaret is super helpful in getting you, you know, you to understand how to best go about that, how to do that in a systematic way. You'll get an understanding of the background of the field you're interested in and you get a publication out of it too. Awesome. Thank you very much. So just a couple of follow-up things. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Stephen and I are going to be talking next week, I think, to all the residents and fellows. Um, but that's really sort of the engine of where a lot of this stuff is happening. So one of the things we're going to be telling them is that we've got 170 you know, medical students who are really interested in doing research, and they will love that. Uh, and so we want to carry them with you. We also want to be really flexible and, and supportive. So the part of the reason for the office hours, but also for um, you know these these projects, the, you know divisional projects or whatever. See, I are the ones who are actually checking the box and making sure that you did the report or that we're not and was it done right. So we wanted those office hours so that you could ask questions. Am I on the right track? Am I doing the right thing? Is this you know is this what you want? Is this what you're looking for? So we can be acceptable for that. Um, and then also, if there's a project that you know you need a faculty mentor, um, but you know there's a resident who's working on something, and you know they haven't identified a faculty member and whatever, we're more than happy to step in and help fill that role um, and, and help to kind of keep the project going along. So we want to be you know uh, just pragmatic about things because the, the most yeah. important thing is to do it, not to you know ram our hands about you know all the. Yeah, yeah, I think that my kind of I'm glad that there's some resources that are getting set up for that. I, my kind of concluding remark is that I think a, a lot of I've observed a lot of M1s and M2s, they get to a point and they, you know, they say, like, I'm not sure what to do next. And my only like answer to that is like pretty much the only wrong thing to do next is nothing, you know, like, like just don't wait. If you're not sure what to do next, do almost anything and ask for feedback on it. And at least you'll be moving something forward in, in, in that way. Thank you. Oh, and also too, thank you, Haberman and Margaret Hoodman. All of you should have had, you know, exposure to Margaret as an M1. Um, and she's just outstanding. She's a, a wonderful resource. Um, we point people to her all the time. She's just super accessible and, and uh, so, Margaret, yeah, thank you for, for being on. And that's great. The other thing is, uh, 
in within medicine, obviously, to establish the computer and and uh, and, and that's computerizing the systems as well. Alex, um, help with my headset, that are things like that. We've opened my invite that to some of the office hours. Um, but again, those are great resources for because uh, the Department of Medicine owns about uh, 20 years worth of data from the, the uh, healthcare cost and utilization project and about 10 years worth of data from the uh, national emergency department system um so there's like bucket loads of data that we have uh, access to publicly available and could be mined for you know any the research expression of your interest yeah you can ask almost any question with that that those are great resources and I'm also going to try and not do the mic only because I think it's easier for everybody to hear and it's small enough room where I think everyone can hear me. Can you hear me, miss? All right, cool. Thanks. Uh, so my name's Justin, and I'm an MD PhD student as well. Uh, like Kate, uh, same exact stuff as Kate. Um, seventh year of the program, went to the University of Michigan undergrad, um, and so Dan and I and um, some others, we have this group called the Biomedical Research Society, and um, you guys can get involved in that. Let's see pretty easily by um, submitting one of these like, hey, give me a research project request forms. Um, but as doctors Kennedy and Haller have alluded to, the um, opportunities that are pre-existing are, are small. We don't have as many faculty uh, projects as we want to have. So we're working on that on our end. Um, both Dan and I and Dr. Kennedy and Haller are soliciting uh, projects from faculty, from students, um, from residents, from uh, fellows. But I think everyone's coming to the same conclusion. Everyone sort of mentioned it in their own way that really we need to be the own drivers of these projects. Uh, you said that the research project, it's not going to be more important to anyone. Uh, it, it's going to be the most important thing to you. Uh, faculty, um, fellows, peers, their attentions and uh, passions, they are fluid and dynamic. But what you like and what you're interested in in your research project, it's important to you. And you have to be the driver of that. And it's been my observation that the big obstacle is, um, for lack of a better word, insecurity. As medical students, we don't, we are not very secure. Our uh, curriculum is constantly changing. We're constantly evaluated. I know that I don't tend to feel very secure in my day to day life and in my future. Everything is a competition and, and we're learning and we're struggling and we're fighting. It's tricky to then pivot and go up to a, a faculty member with a, an idea and sort of pitch it and, and advocate for this. So we have some. Sure. I just wanted to share your slides. Thanks. I'm not sure what folks are on. That's right. So we have some resources. You know, you can use this to get in touch with me directly. And and as um, Drs. Kendi and Haller talked about, we have office hours and, and we sort of coach students one by one through this process. But just speaking in these huge, broad brush strokes, I, I really want to encourage everybody to think about this um, as a, uh, a rising tide raises all ships sort of situation. You guys start research projects and faculty are going to be interested, even if only because you are creating work products that then improve their ability to get funding down the road. So everything that you do, it, it's not necessarily the, the, the faculty, don't conceptualize it like the faculty are sort of um, uh, taking uh, pity on you and, and working with you to get a project. These things help everybody. They help our school, they help our faculty, and they help you. And for all of us, our next big thing is residency uh, applications. So we're trying to bump up our metrics for that. Some of us have a, a real genuine passion in, in research and you know, the scientific method. 
you don't have to have that. And it's okay if you don't have that. It's okay if you just need to get some, some metrics and, and learn this, just like we learn how to do calculus and then maybe not ever use it. Some, some of the, the point of this is just getting, getting into this, um, into the literature, swimming around, figuring how, out how to interact with it, figuring out how to um, read these articles, figuring out how you would produce. You don't have to become an expert. Um, as, as Kate and everyone else says, you just have to do. You just have to keep moving it forward. And when you don't know what to do, reach out to our resources. But, but really, there's no wrong move. Um, the most effective thing that I think that we've been able to do with the Biomedical Research Society is sort of give the students a, a, a cloak of protection in that if you try to approach a faculty and you get any resistance, just blame it on me. Just blame it on us. Uh, Justin said to do it. Uh, the Biomedical Research Society said to do it. Dr. Scan, Dr. Heller encouraged us to reach out to faculty. Uh, we, we can give you that sort of like scapegoat and that protection because really that's what needs to happen on your end. You, you have to go out there. Like Kate said, you have to resend the emails three times. Um, and you guys are all good at being respectful and, and political and, and polite. So that tends not to be an issue. The, the issue is usually getting in your own head about, oh, I don't want to bother this person. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. There's a million things that we could talk about. Um, and again, you guys can use this stuff to come to office hours and, and, and we can talk more. But as with the, with the switching of, of step one, going from graded to pass fail, the importance of research just continues to, to elevate. And we, we need to get involved in that um, as medical students. And to, to do that is, is sometimes really difficult emotionally. Um, so we know that we're here for you. Just keep trucking, keep going. And that's it. Thank you. Justin, what the, turn this back on. When are when are office hours? When do, when do you do office hours at Biomedical Research Society? I, I try and switch it so that things that work for some students don't always work for others. You know, some events, some people have events every Friday. So if you join the like self starters program, which is basically this like mentorship one on one thing where I meet up with everybody in small groups. I just send you what that week's office hours are at the, end, at the beginning of every week. This week they have to be on Friday at four. Perfect. So okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And Alex. Sure, Dr. Kennedy, can you hear me? We can. I don't. I don't know if you're in a place where you can turn a camera on or not. It's already. Um, I'm at Pro. I'm at ProMedica right now, and this computer does not seem to have a camera. So oh, I apologize. Okay. All right. But, so, Alex, take it away. Sure. So my name is Alex. I'm a fourth year applying internal medicine this year. And uh, when I spoke to Dr. Kennedy after one of the first meetings about this like student peer leader program, my intention was just to essentially offer our assistance and our experience as students who, uh, for the most part, have done most of the grunt work um, for a lot of these different research projects and really just to help in any way we can to accelerate uh, student involvement in research, um, particularly like with working with our institutions IRB, because uh, a lot of times it can be challenging if you're if you're doing a study with uh, with HPI and a cohort from um, our institution. It's it's can be challenging at times. It can be kind of complicated, and it can be a time sink. And so um, we wanted to help you with that with those kinds of procedural things. But also, um, you know, we, we want to offer resources in like helping design studies, design research questions, help you conduct lit reviews, um, you know, teach you skills about manuscript writing and submitting to journals and kind of more of an informal level with uh, students who have done it before. And so that's kind of the plain and simple goal of, uh, of this program as I saw it. Um, and so personally, like I can help offer um, resources to those like working in clinical research or outcomes based research. I really don't have a lot of research or experience working in basic science research. So I'll kind of defer to my colleagues who have more experience in that area. Um, but, you know, I'm currently employed at Nationwide Children's Hospital as a research assistant. 
but I've worked in a lot of projects uh, at this institution, both the Department of Internal Medicine and mostly within the Department of Urology and Transplant Urology. And um, so I could specifically help with, with students who want to work with like large databases um, and large database projects. I work with our trans, trans chart and transplant database here at UT. Uh, but I can also help with uh, requesting data from the data warehouses and working with the data analysts, kind of what elements to expect, um, how to how to apply for data and how to get it back in like kind of a timely process. Um, all those things can also just add uh, more and more time to your studies. Um, but also I've worked with both the IRBs at UTMC and ProMedica. And so if students are looking to do projects with the ProMedica or the Toledo Hospital cohort, um, you have to go through this reliance process with UT. And so that can be very complicated at times as well. And so if you have some proper guidance, it can go a lot smoother. And so I can help with that, but really just happy to help with any other aspects of the research process. I've kind of seen um, every step and every stage of, of uh, designing a study to all the way to, to publication. So um, I think my information, you can just feel free to email me or just text me. It's probably just easier to text me. Uh, if you guys you know, want to meet or if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or, you know, obviously, if you don't remember Alex's name, you can email us and, and we'll connect you with them. But Alex, I really appreciate um, coming on and, and offering uh, that. Kind of extra support system, especially for something that's so uh, amenable to to doing research like the the large uh, publicly available data set. Sure. Okay. Last but not least, Daniel. So a lot of very sensitive. Got available step one. Um, the best way, because there's more ways to get involved in it, what I found is helpful is I'm on patient under ice, find a cool case. If you can ask your attending and say, hey, can I write a patient for you? You can ask. Sometimes they may say no, but a lot of the times they say, I have two application boards just for me. Hey, that's going to be different. Another thing that's important is to talk back to their provision. It's a little bit harder to kind of wrangle a clinician. So um, it's important to set up a timeline to say, hey, um, you know, get this published in two months. Um, months we have a draft to go one month. Find up sections, what sections am I responsible for? How are we checking in? Uh, really being persistent about that, about being in the way from Emails over and over again and there's no response to the actual that keep people on track on task. I would repeat the question just the also uh, question was do you have to be looking at, at an academic center or an any preset for uh, revocation report? I wrote a case report um, by myself and, and then asked the fellow if I could publish it. And she said yes, and then we sent it to the attending. I don't even know if they published it anyway. And we got a publication list and all we got for <laughs> So uh, it, it's really self-driven, self-starter, and it's getting better. As long as you're proactive about that, if you get one or two publications,
I don't think you. Um, Margaret, do you have an answer to that question? I, Margaret and I were talking about this because the University of Toledo Journal, um, we get case reports sometimes, and we were recently wondering that same thing. Are these being vetted through IOB? Um, we can, uh, I can get you a better answer to that question, but off the top of my head, I think that we were good. I think we maybe, maybe had to do a submit an IRB, but then it just gets sort of like deemed as exempt and you're good. But I, I really, I can't recall specifically. I, I've never submitted an IRB for it, but I, uh, you do have to submit forms that I think it provides consent. Yeah, and at, uh, I, at ProMedica at Toledo Hospital, that is through their IRB portal, but their forms and everything are set up. You know, there's like a, print out a form for the patient to sign, and then you can fill everything in through their, the IRB portal over here, at least, I don't know. I think that's, I think it's probably the same at UT, Margaret, do you know? So we checked and as long as it's under three cases, you do not have to get IRB approval from U Toledo. Um, but as you've just heard, every single IRB is different, so Depending on who your collaborators happen to be, it's probably best to check with their approving committees to see what they think. Most journals also now require patients to sign consent for them to publish a case report. A lot of the at the journal level instead of the IRB level are, are, are requesting that. So not necessary. I mean, usually most of the time it's like a box that you check, like did the patient give consent for this case report? So I, you know, I, I'd recommend you answer that question, honestly. I see. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, do you understand what you meant by during less than three? So sometimes you have like five cases of this thing, and so you want to be serious. I think Barbara was saying as long as it's less than three, uh, I need one case, two cases, uh, then you're good. And the, the process for, so don't be intimidated by IRB uh, for this either, the exempt. Uh, uh, Process is really very simple. Um, so it's essentially it's just it's just you know coming out in the eyes and crossing the teeth to make sure that uh, you know everything is is followed over the process in terms of you know informed consent, etc. But it's not it's it's not onerous. Once you get into multi center clinical trials, you might get a little you know, scared. But other than that, the exam process is really easy and really both at ProMed and even at everything. With the uh, with a lot of this stuff of the IRB, um, it's not hard. It's time consuming. There's very little uh, repercussions to failure in these processes. All these forms are so complicated. Um, you're you're going to mess. Everyone knows that. You know that. The person reviewing it knows that. So when they get these forms, they don't go. So <laughs> they, they just write a very like, okay, oh, thanks for this. Do you need to update this and change this and do this? And they work with you on it. So never be intimidated by those uh bureaucratic processes. You just you just get through. And they had a question for you. Where do you publish your your, your case reports? What what journals? Since people are always looking for journals that accept oh. case reports. Uh, that's a nice question. <laughs> It was really memorable. <laughs> I think it was. If you Google, like, where can I publish my paper or something, there's a website that comes up where you, you type in, like, what the keywords are, and it'll match you with a bunch of journals. Um, I think I submitted it to like four or five journals and they were like, so not so not so so it's a little bit of a trial and error process. Uh which is so easy to do, it's so quick. Um review articles are also super easy to get published. Um it filled with wire up a lot of data collection. So I get asked about review articles all the time. The bench work stuff takes a little bit of time as well. Especially kind of coming in on a project and you're working with that project. So, but um, one or two, it comes to 
great group of students that are going to ask detailed questions about the ground and So, uh, Flyer I should have brought up today, but well, so there's a little just follow up and work kind of published a case report. The Journal of Investigative Medicine has a special journal for high impact case reports, um, so that's available as, as well. Um, and we'll be uh, promoting also the, the meeting that goes along with that because that, that's the Journal of the American Federation of Medical Research, and uh, the, the meeting that they have is, is uh, open to presentations. Case as well. So uh, that's a great opportunity to talk about you know publishing them, but also you can present them as an abstract uh, and meeting. And that's that's a great kind of metric as well. But, um, we had a couple questions from online and I'll post them and just we can we can run around the, the line. I know Alex had to, to go. Um, the first one was I really I guess Rebecca kind of close to what you were saying. I'm interested in, in doing um, well, first of all was how how do I think ones uh, work, life, travel, you know, and even doing research. So if we have maybe a couple more minutes, if people just want to share a brief thought, maybe Kate will start on that review um, on, you know, the, the uh, words of wisdom uh, for, for balancing work life, uh, travel, family. Hey, how do you balance? How do you do it? How do you balance it? I'm laughing, Kate's not away. Uh, <laughs> Ignore your home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You um, it it helps when uh, your your spouse is interested in the same thing you are. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely tough. I I, I it de it depends what you're looking for. I mean, I I enjoy doing research. I like spending my time doing that. I understand that that's not going to be uh, everyone's answer. Um. My best advice would be to try and cultivate a group of peers that want to work on it with you so that it doesn't feel quite like such a, you know, like a slog that you're doing it by yourself. Like you can enjoy your time while you're working on the research, too, and um, maybe make some friends while you're doing it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you're not going to have balance every day for sure. I mean, you no doubt you guys have already experienced that as med students. You just kind of have to pick what's the priority for any given day and uh, hope that you get some semblance of balance out in the end. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm. I'll be like very upfront. I'm like I'm a bad person to ask that that question to. I I lead a, a pretty unbalanced life. That's not a lot because like we do not have a balanced life. And I, you know, I, I know that. Right. I'm not gonna lie. To you. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Like I I yeah. I spend. It's. This is what I spend most of my time doing. But that makes me happy. So. Yeah. Um. My wife despises me. <laughs> yeah, Dan yeah. can speak more to me. She, uh, my, my wife is a movie director, Rebecca, and she, if I'm on the computer, we're going to get it out this way. I think she can fun. Um, <laughs> so I think what I do is I work when she's on call. Um, a good week to do it is. Week after your test, whatever test that is, you know. <laughs> so, um, if you're entering on the board, like in a Google question bank, you don't really do a whole lot of adversity. Um, so, I would try to front load research in those weeks because you're obviously going to get more work fixed in the school. So, yeah, I just write down time to be consistent for those in the last. I, I do. Can I, I have one thing to add if I can, and that is my piece of advice is when you take time off or when you decide to take time off, actually just commit to having that time off. Because if you're going to take the time off and feel guilty about not working the whole time and feel anxious about not doing work the whole time, then it's really not restful time off anyway. So if you decide like today's going to be a day to take off, like make a commitment to yourself that you're just going to accept and be okay with that. Otherwise, it's not going to be even worth Worth doing it. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I would probably definitely say I try to think more of a balance of like work research and this kind of thing. Yeah, um, clearly that is not a PhD. But uh, for me, I think I kind of tackled uh, research kind of like I would, you know, studying for class or doing Google. 
Um, I'm really bad at like, sitting there for hours and hours and hours doing it. I just I can't focus for that long. But what I learned to do is to kind of make a plan and do a piecemeal. So at first, like, you know, just getting tasked with, like, okay, like, write a review paper about this, like, brand new area that you've never read in or even research this topic. Um, it's super intimidating to do it because I just type it in with, like, 50,000 results. You know, like, okay, like, what do I do with this? Um, but I found that what we do is we just kind of start one at a time. Um, and if you just say, okay, today we're going to like, read two papers about this topic. Um, and over time, in like some of these, like, surprisingly fast, actually, you start to notice patterns. Like, we are citing all the same, like, major papers, and you start to see, okay, so these are kind of the, like, landmark things that have been done in this field. Um, once you find those, then you kind of build this network, and then suddenly, as you can see, it's much more manageable, right? Because people are just referencing each other. And, you know, after a couple of weeks of doing this, you're like, wow, you know, like, I feel almost like an expert in this area just from, you know, reading a, a couple of papers each day. Um, and then you start getting more comfortable with the background and being able to write and kind of, you know, talk about whatever it is the topic that you have. Um, and then, yeah, after the test, doing work then, you do a good time. Um, and then, I, yeah, you know, I think that's what really good fast way. The follow up on that was uh, I wanted that there was some students that I want to do research outside of University of Toledo um, during during a summer. So advice on on that. I know you do actually do that. So you know, how do you approach it? Uh, you know how what were the barriers? What were the success? Uh, so this I have friends who've done this too, and everybody's story is a little bit different. So I was very lucky because I have already known this um, person. Prior to my post, I actually shadowed him uh, for the undergraduate, like during the undergrad. Um, so, you know, there was already a connection there. So, very easy to kind of reach out and say, okay, I'm interested in doing research, like, do you have any projects? Um, I know some friends have done it uh, with their actual undergrad PI, so they also kind of have a private connection there. Um, but I think if you kind of keep going in cold, uh, I, there's no harm in just reaching out to people. Like, Kind of like everyone's already mentioned, you know, you know, have to send in any emails um, just because everyone's super busy. Uh, you know, you might not necessarily get an answer, but kind of, I guess, the worst thing that can happen is you get ignored and your notes worse off than you were before. So I would just say um, if there's someone you find that, you know, there's something interesting, you just try and try to help with that. Um, and then obviously, if you do have people that you know, like in your personal life or you've worked with prior, um, or have like friends that know people doing research, I mean, use those connections. Uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. Any further extensions? Yeah. 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 Ye
Joe, I, I know you're really busy. I, I just want to remind you, you know, right? I need to visit all the hospitals and, you know, you know, another tactic that we use um, is talking to the administrative assistant. Um, and then saying, hey, I know, you know, Dr. So and so went really busy. Can you see that? Would you mind letting them know that I was interested because, you know, that, that's another you know, good way to come together and friends and friends? I'm excited that every email we send with the And then, you know, sort of the following up on the connections outside, we'll be promoting, um, I think it is uh, starting in this, the, so the Central Society for Clinical and Translational Research and the American Federation of Medical Research um, are going to start soliciting their uh, abstracts. Um, and that's a great meeting, a multidisciplinary meeting um, that will help promote and encourage uh, if you have projects to submit to. Um, yeah, I think there. I think there's a yeah, final date that we need in February. So if there's a page report or something, you can submit that. Um, but those are great opportunities if your abstract gets get accepted to go and network and to meet people and to you know say, oh, you're at University of Chicago and you know you like chocolate, I like peanut butter, like let's you know work together. And you know, so that I think having those opportunities is, is, and, and growing things outside the university to me those are great things. Thank you. Good for a wrap up. Yeah, So um, we will uh, we'll be hanging around here if you have any other questions. Talk well, but this, thank you guys. Oh, this is an awesome. Um, I will uh, put my email in the chat, and you guys can feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I think. Alex sent something. Thanks, everyone. Here's my contact. Hey, thank you so much. Margaret, thank you. And Margaret, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I have to take this.